guys. I am here with Jacob Shapiro. Super excited to have him on. He is actually in front of one of their locations. He is with Outpost and he is actually the New York, he's the account, let me make sure I get this right, the New York account manager, right? Correct. Yep. But you've been there since the beginning. So you've Correct. seen, you, you know the company inside out. That's why we're very excited because you guys have four partners, right? Four different people. Three actually. Oh, three total? Three, three plus me. Um, okay. And then, yep, we manage basically our 14 part-time and full-time employees. Nice. And you guys started, so give us a little bit of history of Outpost. And again, you guys are just yeah. strictly based in New York, right? Yeah. Okay. So as a, as a, as a brief history, um, Outpost was started by uh, three guys who came to the United States and realized how unfortunate um, really the New York renting market is. Um, it's a terrible process if you want to go through it. Um, it's really high barrier financially to enter um, with, you know, first and last month's rent plus a security deposit equivalent to a full month's rent. Um, you could empty your entire bank account doing that. Uh, you uh, need to have background checks and credit checks, um, which many international arrivals do not have. And, um, and you know, many other you know, financial barriers um, and simply you can be denied for, for no apparent reason. Um, so they didn't like that and decided to um, you know, recreate the process for housing in New York City to make it as easy, or at least this is our goal, to make it as easy as buying a cup of coffee. I love that. That's a great USP. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Good deal. Yeah. And you guys have I, how many locations total and how many rooms total? Yeah, we have uh, eight locations uh, spread out between uh, Brooklyn and Queens at the moment, and uh, we have 160 beds. Nice. Awesome. And then it takes a team, like you said, you guys have a good team to manage it all. What's your yep. current occupancy rate, roughly? De depends on the time of year. So as most uh, co-living spaces go through seasonality, so do we. Um, so during the summers, our high season, we often operate around 80 to 90 percent occupancy, uh, while kind of the rest of the year is more 60 to 70 percent. Cool. And then you live, have you lived, you live in one of the concepts right now. Have you lived mm -hmm. in one of the homes the whole time? Yeah. Since I moved in, literally the first day I started working, I moved into our Flatbush house, uh, located in Flatbush, Brooklyn. Um, and from there, uh, I lived there for about a month, uh, and, you know, kind of became really good friends with the people who lived at that house. Uh, and from there I moved to our Knickerbocker house. Um, and I stayed there again for about three, four months. And in the process of filling that house up, uh, I moved to our Ridgewood house, which is where I've been for the last year. Nice. And then ta we talked a little bit before we jumped on this interview, um, but let's go into that. Um, we were kind of kidding around because sometimes the houses get overbooked, especially in high mm -hmm. season. Because <laughs> I said, mm -hmm. oh my, God, my LA house is like overbooked next month for two weeks. Yeah. So I, I'm either leaving or on an air mattress or I'm homeless pretty much which is always fun. But you had said you guys had kind of like, sometimes you get all in one room because you start renting out all the available beds. <laughs> yep, Spe specifically in the beginning, uh, you know, the owners had the Flatbush house uh, and then the Knickerbocker house. That's kind of the prog progression of the houses. And uh, uh, after the Flatbush house filled up, they had nowhere to go and they had to basically open a new house um, to, to house themselves as well as others. Um, which caused them to open the Knickerbocker house. And from there, that house all moved in, uh, eventually all into one room uh, so that they could rent all the other rooms and then it opened up the Ridgewood house. Hashtag startup life. <laughs> we've, <laughs> we've all been there. Oh my gosh, that's awesome, Jacob. Okay, so let's see. I've got a list of a few questions here for you. So, I mean, you've already kind of talked about the evolution of how each home has started. Is the growth more rapid? Is it quicker now with the um, purchasing of the homes on scale yeah. right now? Well, to clarify, um, we'll start there. Is, um, our homes are not purchased. So we, oh, yeah. at the moment, are renting our houses, but plan to do two purchase houses once uh, you know we get around to funding. Um, and uh, yeah, so it depends on how you want to grow. Uh, if you would like to go the rental route, you have less control of the house, obviously, because you don't own it, but you do get to grow quicker because the amount of investment startup is the startup investment is a smaller amount than putting, you know, you know, our houses, our New York houses, you can imagine the prices. So 
um, yeah, that's basically the way it goes. If you, if you decide to uh, own the house, uh, you get a lot more freedom to do with what you want with the house, but you also probably won't grow as fast unless you have some major source of capital. No, and that was actually two of my questions because we're the same exact thing in California. Say, I mean, your mm -hmm. your guys' prices are higher, but <laughs> you guys beat us. Yeah. Um, that's what Kendra Quarters is doing. We're uh, we didn't. I'm self funded. We're not taking outside money quite yet. And even I, we've had the offers, and I'm like, the investors stop. The market is way too high right now. I wouldn't even mm -hmm. purchase. Um, let's wait until it cracks. Got it. So you're waiting for yeah. You're waiting, we're waiting for, for the, the prices correction. to go down. Same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Same. Okay. Yeah. That's, so, a, that's a great point. Yeah. So the least turn. So on the funding side, are you guys actively searching for funding right now or no? We are. Um, we are currently in the running for uh, an accelerator program um, called NUMA. Um, NUMA is an accelerator based in here. Actually, they're based in Paris. They have locations around the world. And they're actually the oldest accelerator in the world. And uh, we've been speaking with many of their members um, to basically you know, um, you know, see if we'd be a right fit for their program. Um, but if we decide to go with them, that would probably be the next 10 months of our lives. Um, oh, for is, sure. You know, looking, for sure. yeah, looking for funding and you know, doing that. So. And then you guys haven't gone private equity. You guys haven't approached any VCs. Uh, we have approached VCs uh, individually, um, but generally they like, at least in New York, for people to go through accelerators, incubators to, to be contacted as those guys are the guys who are vouching on your behalf. But, um, you know, our original round of funding was kind of a family and friends thing. Um, small amount of money um, allowed us to open up. Uh, and from there, um, yeah, we've opened up our house. Nice. That's exciting. And then now jumping back to lease term, um, how long of a lease do you guys sign on the properties? Depends on the property, but... Um, the longer the better. Generally, it's around five five years. Okay, because you guys are going in and furnishing these homes too, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. Cool. Exactly. Yeah, because we did a three year um, in LA. Yeah, three to five. I agree. Three to five. I've heard of some co living companies doing 10, 10 year leases. Mm -hmm. um, right. That's that's a long time. <laughs> I'd like yeah. to start buying before then. So uh, right. At three, Good point. Is like perfect. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Good to know. Perfect. And then let's see here. What does your typical day include? Because again, this is nice. I've been interviewing, yeah. you know, the software side of co-living. I've done interviews with the founders. So now it's nice to kind of be yeah. in the trenches every day, all day yeah. for what we said over two years now. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, good question. Um, so as I mentioned, my title is uh, the New York account manager, uh, which is intentionally vague. Um, simply because, you know, you know, just as well as I do startups, everyone's doing everything. Right. So, um, my typical day to break it down very simply, uh, I do three main things. Um, first is I do business to business sales. So if, um, you know, I contact, um, New York based businesses that are, you know, that, that it seems as if they're members or students or, you know, business partners will need uh, short-term or temporary housing, more like mid-term housing. We only rent for longer than a month. So um, if, if they need that, uh, we, you know, we will contact them um, and set up business accounts with them. Um, so that's my main uh, sales aspect is I deal with the business to business sales. Second piece is I, uh, on the operational side is I do um, kind of, the best way to explain it is cross departmental um operations so if the sales team needs to talk to our house leaders if um if our house leaders need to talk to um our you know handyman or operations team um you know we will you know I, I facilitate those types of conversations um to make sure more like project-based things get done um and lastly i would say is uh just formalizing um processes that haven't been created yet so Anything from creating the operations manual to um, originally when we created the sales process, I was, you know, part of, you know, creating the original sales process of how, you know, potential clients become current clients become alumni um, and really everything in between how to hold events, how to get funding for events for like our members can hold events as well. Um, our house leaders hold events as well, you know, creating that process. 
um, formalizing everyone's job description. I've done all that. So I love it. And then the de what is the demographic actually of the people that stay at the home? And you said it's a one month minimum. You guys don't do less than a month, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. And that's just based off New York housing policy. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, operate within the law of New York. So, uh, or New York city, city rather. Um, so our, uh, our, our demographic is basically uh, about half American, half international, about um, about 30% students, and the rest are people who are already in their profession. And when I say students, it's really of every background, right? So, um, you know, undergrad, graduate, and doctorate, it's all the same. Um, and what else? So age group is probably between like 20 and 35, but we've hosted many people who are older than 35. Um, and yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay. Similar, similar, uh, demographic, mm -hmm. it seems like, especially the age. And then there's right. never been any like that. It seems like this demographic too, um, is more trusting. They leave their stuff out there. I mean, we've never had, we leave laptops out, iPhones, all sorts of stuff laying so out. True. We don't lock the doors yeah. half the time. So it's like, exactly. um, it, you guys, same thing in your guys' neighborhood. Yeah in your home exactly okay cool. yeah even you know even being in new york city we're okay with that um so our outdoor the door behind me obviously has a lock on it the door to the physical apartment obviously has a lock on it however within the house there are no locks on doors to bedrooms um and and that's one because of the fire code uh, we're not allowed to do that but two because we're trying to create a communal atmosphere um and you know the design decisions that you make within the home are make um nonverbal um, um communications or nonverbal um you know points of reference for your members right and if you have locks on doors it's basically saying you know keep your stuff in your room keep don't don't move your stuff out of your room it's the that's you know however even if we were allowed to do it we wouldn't have done it um, and we also have other ways to keep people safe as well. Like there are lockers throughout the house if you do want to use your valuables. But if we were to go inside right now, there are no lockers. <laughs> no one is using the lockers, that is to say. Um, and uh, yeah, there are no locked valuables. Oh my God, I love that concept. No, that's amazing. And I think you're exactly right that you're going to deter the people that are super fearful and that energy of them being scared someone's going to steal their stuff, scared of you know, you're going to deter those people if you're like, hey, this is how we live. We don't lock the mm -hmm. door, these doors. Your stuff's yeah. fine. Like, I think you're going to have more of those carefree people that aren't exactly. so attached to physical mm -hmm. belongings. And it, yeah. it creates a better energy. So I'm glad you, Absolutely. oh, that's interesting. No, because we're the it's, same uh, and everybody laughs. Or, you know, when a new person comes in, it throws them off at first because mm -hmm. they might have not been used to that. And yep. then they get used to it, right? And it's a, in the first house, even our first Epic Entrepreneur house, like two years ago, I'm like, wait, we're not locking the front door. We're not, like nobody owned a key to the house. <laughs> like no, that's, day, I think they that's a little crazy. <laughs> I know, okay. right? I mean, it's a beautiful name. That's insane. Yeah, yeah. So we were just like, we don't have keys to the front door because, cool. yeah. So it was a really, it, it took a little getting used to, but yeah. Um, I right. agree. I think that's a great, you know, again, that's the culture you're building is more of based on trust and abundance, mm -hmm. not scarcity right. and fear. That's mm -hmm. cool. Um, and then what other guys you're talking, I'm like thinking of these great, oh, and you said you're going to give us a quick tour. Are we going to peek? Are we going to walk through that? Are we allowed we to walk through We can do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. We can do that. Okay, we can do a good quick tour. Like, yeah, quick do you want to do that now? Yeah, let's do it. Sure. I will pull it up right now. Wow, this is a first virtual tour on uh, one of our interviews. Yeah. Uh, no, this will be great because, yeah, we're sharing right. interviews on our YouTube channel. And then, of course, cool. um, doing the interview in our book that's coming out, The Co-Living Code. So I cool. really appreciate your time, Jacob. This is, this is exciting. <laughs> cool. I'm just trying to figure out how to flip the camera around. There we go. So cool. don't and take a look at our code. For that. Which location is this? So I'll give you a tour in a moment. So this is our Ridgewood house. This is the entryway. Um, the Ridgewood house has 14 bedrooms and 25 beds. So it's a mix of private rooms and shared rooms. Nice. I'll give you a peek of my room specifically so we can take a look. So again, no look at the code. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. 
So here is our kitchen area, nice. our big downstairs kitchen. This is Tasia, actually. She's our community manager for Outburst Club. Hello. Helps hold events and do uh, things of that nature. Here is our board saying, I like this board. So it says, where are you at? And it shows where everyone in the house lives. That is so cool. That's yeah. really cool. And so that's our, that's our, our thing. Um, and I'm going to take you down to the basement. I'm going to figure out where the lights are first. Maybe they're down there. So our basement is our major common area. So I'll move back so you can see the whole thing. But and it's here, about 10 a.m. So everybody's probably at work or out and about. Yeah, it's exactly. 10 a.m. there on a Thursday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is our co-working space and uh, living room. Oh. And what else? And how many square feet total do you guys have? How many square feet total does this house have? I don't know. The, I don't know the answer to that. I'm always really bad at that. I just know yeah. bedrooms, kitchens, living rooms, and that type of thing. So now I'm going upstairs. Uh, so on both of those floors, off the kitchen and off the other one, there are, um, what is it called? There are bedrooms. Actually, I'll go to this apartment. Um, so. You had explained earlier that each oh, apartment, no. so everybody has access to any of the actual yep. apartment levels. Yep. Okay, yeah, cool. physical apartment. So now we're upstairs. Here's our kitchen and area upstairs. So if like there's too much going, going on downstairs, people can come upstairs to do, use this space as well. Cool. Love it. Right. Example of a bathroom. Awesome. There. And then lastly, we can take a look at my private room. Oh, nice. So this is my room. And I wish I prepared it for the tour. Yeah, that's okay. You know? No, it's good. Hey, decent cool. size for New York though, right? Exactly. <laughs> awesome. I appreciate that. that quick tour. That was amazing. Yeah, awesome. sure. Okay, so I got a couple more questions and then we'll wrap it up for you. I know you'll want to probably need to get on with your busy day. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see here. Do you guys have a list of like house rules or guest commitments, um, roommate, like any sort of like set of rules that you guys give people when they move in? Absolutely. Yep. So people sign a membership agreement, which is basically a lease. Um, and, you know, it's very extensive, uh, more extensive than your average uh, lease simply because of the amenities that are included in the house. So yes, we do have rules. Um, and then there are little rules around the house, um, to explain, you know, basically how you, you should interact with a aspects of the house. So our, one of our lovely house leaders is a graphic designer and he has designed for us a, um, three sets of rules that we get to put all around the house, actually four sets of rules. So there's one for the kitchen, one for the whole house, one for the bedrooms, and then one, and then little signs that go around that are um, non-English signs. They're all, they're all signage, like um, icons, so oh. that people of, any, uh, people of any language capability can understand how to interact with those things. Yeah, because you already said 50% of your guys' yep. occupants are international. Yep. Wow. Okay, cool. And a lot of them, not a lot of them, but I'd say 80 to 90% have full you know, English speaking capabilities, but many of them have, um, what else? They have, uh, uh, they're, they're here for language school, so okay. they are learning English. So okay. there's, there's a decent portion of them that are doing that as well. And then do you guys do events at your homes? We do. So each house has two events per month. And anyone from any house can go to any event. So uh, basically people have access to around two events per week. Nice, okay, cool. And you guys invite outside people to those events also? We do, uh, we charge, so we, it, all the events can be found on the back end of our website. Once you become a current member, you can RSVP yourself and your friends. Friends are paid though, right? Members are paying for these events. Um, and a friend is not paying for the access to the event. So, um, we charge for them. Got it. Perfect. Depends on, depends on the event. If it's, if it doesn't cost us any money, it doesn't cost them any money, but yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's definitely. And then um, kind of like before we jumped on again, we spoke a little bit about, you know, you've been in this, you know, so many people in the co-living industry. And again, it's such a new industry. So it's exciting that you've been in it for a couple of years already. Yeah. Um, so what's your personal opinion on the future of co-living? Mm -hmm. uh, I would say uh, we haven't seen every iteration of the type of 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 the niche yet right there's we're in a niche category in real estate right but within that niche there will be other smaller niches right you mentioned before it would be really cool to open houses for single mothers it'd be really cool to open houses as there already are for entrepreneurs it would be really cool to open houses for artists as there again already is um we we haven't seen all those um and i don't know other than the entrepreneurial bout um the viability financially for some of those things i like it i love the idea um sounds super cool but the i, I heard this this other real estate investor talk um about location and that location is your best and your worst asset right because if you have a great location that's great but you also can never move your location right Sometimes single mother house sounds fantastic for single mothers to live in, but it's just not the right neighborhood, right? Uh, this, this guy, he said, uh, money, he say money talks, but real estate does not walk. Um, <laughs> nice. You know, so, <laughs> like so it's a great, it's a great way of saying it. Um, so while location can be a, a great asset, it can also uh, limit the scope of people capable of living in your house. Um, and for us, we are intentionally, um, you know, non-interest based, right? We have some houses that form their own small interest-based groups, but people move in and out. So, you know, those, those waves go, come and go, right? So, um, yeah, I'd say for the, the future, it looks bright. I think, as I mentioned in the beginning, looking to uh, create, a, um, create a new type of real estate product that is as easy as buying a cup of coffee, as I mentioned. Um, and I can go a little bit further into that to kind of understand what I mean by that. So if you go to Starbucks, you know how much a cup of coffee costs before even walking in, you know, around how much it costs, you know, how much the upgrade should cost, you know, how much, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, a latte is going to be more expensive than a cup of coffee. You know that if you go to a Starbucks anywhere in the world, it's going to be a similar cost and the same cup of coffee. Um, and you know that that international brand is safe and you can, and, and it can be found basically anywhere. Um, if you open your phone, none of those consumer luxuries are available in the real estate market. There is no international brand where you can go live anywhere in the world. There is no way of knowing how much a walk-in closet, how much more expensive a walk-in closet is versus not having a walk-in closet. Um, and, uh, and the, yeah, basically that's the upgrade, the upgrade aspect of it. Um, and there, like I said, there's no international brand that, you know, is safe, right? There's no way of knowing how much the house behind me is in comparison to the house next to me. Um, so it's, you know, those types of things are changing. And as the kind of real estate market becomes more democratized, uh, it'll just benefit consumers. No, I love it. And I love industry disruption. <laughs> Real estate's a 200, which you probably know this number, $200 trillion industry is real estate. And no, it's like who can come in and exactly what you just said, like create that infrastructure right. on a global level. Because mm -hmm. uh, you're right, Starbucks, anywhere you go, you know what you're going to get, you know how much it is. You can pay with an app on your phone, which I mm -hmm. do. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. they've made it so seamless. And how do you yep. do that with real estate? Um, and not yep. have these crazy credit checks and income verifications and background checks. And like, how do you make all that so user friendly, like push of a button? Because nowadays, yes. especially the millennials, and we, we had one stay here. I w I'm going to interview him when he's back. He literally has a backpack and he's just like randomly staying at Airbnbs, staying on at people's houses. And he's jumping mm -hmm. from different cities and different states. I actually have a couple friends doing this right now as we speak and they're just like, there's no plan. And then they do, they end up staying at some weird places. <laughs> yeah. You know, he came back the next day. He's like, Oh, they were dealing drugs and all this. And it was in Hollywood. And I'm like, yeah, that's the 